Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today is the eve of Yom HaShoah, which is the Holocaust Day of Remembrance, which commemorates the immeasurable losses of the Holocaust and also calls us into action to work towards the promise of never again. My name is Amanda Smith Byron, and I'm faculty at Portland State University, where I direct the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project, and also where we are launching a new graduate certificate in Holocaust and Genocide slash Atrocity Prevention. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's presentation on mass atrocities, could it happen in the US, with one of my esteemed mentors, Dr. James Waller. This event is part of our Rising Up for Human Dignity series, which honors Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month every April. On behalf of Portland State University's Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project, I wanna thank all of our partners in this series, Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, Never Again Coalition, World Oregon, Oregon Historical Society, First Congregational Church of Christ, and The Immigrant Story. We are hosting this event in Portland, Oregon, which rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kethlamet, Clackamas, Watlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other indigenous nations along the Columbia River. As guests on these lands, we respect and honor the work of indigenous nations, leaders and families, their knowledge, creativity, resilience, and resistance. We also acknowledge the systemic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many indigenous Native American families today. Fighting against these atrocities requires us as occupiers of this land to listen and actively amplify indigenous voices. This year, the Rising Up for Human Dignity series is offered completely online, and we acknowledge that all of us are participating through technological devices that contain conflict minerals. And the, extract, the extraction of conflict minerals has motivated and perpetuated armed conflict that contributes to societal instability, rape, and other forms of extreme violence, particularly in the Democratic Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. We are grateful for the means of connection and communication these precious resources allow and affirm our commitment to use them to advocate for justice, accountability, and restoration of peace and stability in the lands of their origin. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Waller and following his presentation, peace building advocates, Mike Brand and Jess Murray, who will join us for their responses, engaging questions and conversation from their unique perspectives in policymaking and atrocity prevention. So Dr. James Waller is the inaugural Cohen Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State College in New Hampshire, home to the Cohen Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Dr. Waller also serves as the Director of Academic Programs with the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities, as the Curriculum Developer and Lead Instructor for the Raphael Lemkin Seminars on Genocide Prevention. His research on perpetrators of genocide is detailed in Becoming Evil, um, How Ordinary People Commit Genocide and Mass Killings, and Confronting Evil, Engaging Our Responsibility to Prevent Genocide. His newest book, A Troubled Sleep, Risk and Resilience in Contemporary Northern Ireland, was published just this year. And I just got an email this morning that Keene State is hosting a virtual book launch for him next week. So maybe he can pass around that invitation or I can pass around that invitation if you'd like to attend it. Um, today, he will share his findings from his recent report on risks in the United States published through the Stanley Center for Peace and Security. So again, I'll introduce Mike and Jess when we um, finish with Dr. Waller's comments, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Waller. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you, Amanda, very much for the kind introduction. Uh, welcome everyone. And I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person. Um, Portland is one of my favorite cities in the world. And I really wish, as I'm sure we all do, that I had a chance to be there in person and we had a chance to be together face to face for this discussion. But nonetheless, we're together now. And I want to thank uh, the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education for their role in pulling together this event. 
But I particularly want to thank Amanda Smith Byron because Amanda, this is a discussion we've had for about two years now, trying to figure out a date and time for this event and everything in the world has seemed to conspire against us, but we pulled it off. We're here together today. So thank you very much, Amanda. And thanks to all of you who are in, or who are in attendance as well. Uh, for the interest and commitment that you show to the work of peace building that Portland State has been doing so well for so many years. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. And Amanda, can you see that okay? Perfect. Thank you very much. So what I want to talk about today is the escalating risk of mass violence in the US. And as Amanda said, I'm going to base this quite a bit on a report I did in early November before the election for the Stanley Center for Peace and Security, a nonprofit organization uh, located at Muscatine, Iowa. But I want to give you the broader frame of where this work fits in terms of my background and the expertise that I try to bring to it as well. As Amanda mentioned in 2016, I published the uh, book Confronting Evil engaging our responsibility to prevent genocide. And in that book, I laid out all the different ways we can think about genocide prevention before conflict happens, when conflict is happening, and after conflict is over, and we look at rebuilding post-conflict and post-atrocity societies. In the before piece, which I've called upstream prevention, I focused on what we knew everything we knew at that point in time about risk factors. What puts a country and a society at risk of the potential for mass violence? Mass violence that could end up exploding into war crimes, crimes against humanity, or the crime of genocide. So in that book, I, I reviewed all the various risk models we had for understanding the risk that, that, place, that puts societies at risk for mass violence and try to compile what we knew the best, it seemed to me at that time, about how we understand risk assessment in terms of upstream prevention. The most recent book that Amanda mentioned, A Troubled Sleep, is actually coming out in two days on April 9th. So um, please head down to Powell's City of Books, one of my favorite bookstores in the world, and you can ask to purchase the book there. But in that book, I've taken that risk assessment lens and I've, apply, I've applied it to a very specific case study of a country I've, I've worked in for a very long period of time, and that's Northern Ireland. And I've looked at Northern Ireland through the lens of risk, particularly as Brexit has impacted it. And if you've been keeping up with the news in Northern Ireland, you know that day by day now, we're seeing increasing amounts of unrest and violence in that country as the implications of Brexit unfold. So between those two books, what I was asked to do by the Stanley Center was to take that risk assessment lens and apply it to the US. I had first done this for the Center for International Law in January 2017, after the presidential election, suggesting that there are various areas of concern that we would have in the US about the, pro the escalating risk of mass violence. The Stanley Center came to me uh, earlier in 2020 and asked if I would repeat that analysis now based on what had happened over the past several years in the Trump administration and the escalating risk that seemed to be facing us as the election for uh, November election was unfolding. So this paper, which you can easily find online and you can download the PDF for free, this paper was published uh, the week before the election. And in the paper, I had predicted that the potential for mass violence was exceptionally high between the time of the election and the time of the inauguration. And in a paper I go through all the reasons that I could look at in terms of risk to make the case that the risk for mass violence was increasingly high and actually escalating over that time period. And unfortunately, as we saw on January 6th, uh, that prediction came true. It certainly is something I wish I had predicted and hadn't come true. But in truth, all the risk factors that we've been concerned about for mass violence were pointing in the same direction. And January 6th was, if not inevitable, 
certainly entirely predictable. So what I wanna do with you and the time I have with you today is think a little bit about how is it that we assess risk of mass violence? What are we looking for? And then to look at the four categories I've worked in for risk assessment of governance, conflict history, economic conditions, and social fragmentation, and to take a very quick look at how the US stands with each of those. And in a way, what I'm, I'm trying to do here is similar to what I've done for other countries. For instance, several years ago, I wrote a risk assessment paper for Burundi. And I asked the questions of, in terms of governance, where does Burundi stand for risk? What factors does it have to mitigate risk? How do they understand their conflict history? What are the economic conditions and the impact on, on life in Burundi? And what is social fragmentation like? So what I'm doing in this presentation and what I did in this paper for the Stanley Center was to ask the same questions of my own country, the US. And then we'll conclude the talk by looking at the question of to what degree this is who we are. Is this reflective of who we are? How does it, how is it consistent or inconsistent with who we aspire to be and who we desire to be? So I'll start by talking about risk assessment and say that in terms of assessing risk of conflict or risk of mass violence, we can think of two competing metaphors. One metaphor would be, as you see on the left-hand side of the screen, the black swan. Black swans are incredibly unusual. They're highly unlikely, highly improbable. When you see one, you notice it because it's completely unexpected. It's a complete surprise. It goes completely against the grain of what we expect to see and what we think of when we think of a swan. For a long time, when people talked about risk of violent conflict or mass atrocities, they treated it like the black swan metaphor. That when war broke out, when genocide broke out, when crimes against humanity broke out, that we just never saw it coming. We can't believe anything like this would ever happen. This is so rare, so unexpected. How in the world could we have expected to be aware enough to prevent this from occurring? Because it's just such an exceptional occurrence. I would say that approach to understanding the origins of violent conflict and mass atrocities for the past 20 years, at least, hasn't been any longer defensible. We know today what the risk factors are. We know what the signs and symptoms are. So I think the better metaphor today is on the right-hand side of the screen is the charging gray rhino. We see it right in front of us. We know what risk is. We know what risk looks like. We know when risk is starting to escalate. We know what accelerates risk and we know what triggers risk in that accelerating framework. It's there in front of us. So today, the issue is not we don't see it coming. The issue is we absolutely see it coming, just like we see a charging rhino coming. But how do we respond in order to mitigate the risk and try to increase resilience? Another way of thinking about this, to go back to Northern Ireland, is to think of the bonfire, bonfires that Protestant Unionist Loyalist communities build on the 11th of July every year. They didn't do it last year because of COVID. I do think they're planning to do it again this year, despite restrictions. These bonfires celebrate a victory uh, from the 17th century of Protestantism over Catholicism. They are triumphalistic bonfires. These bonfires are months in the building. They'll start if, I mean, they've absolutely started building these bonfires already. And here you see an example of one. This is a bonfire several stories high and you get some sense of the scale of it just from looking at the background. This is what we're doing in risk assessment. We're asking the question, how big is this stack of wood? How much wood is there? How much risk is there? We're asking questions of, is the risk dowsing gasoline? We're asking questions of what are the matches that can be struck to light this stack of wood on fire? So in risk assessment, we're trying to gauge how much wood, how much risk is stacked in this particular uh, country or situation. And then what we worry about is we worry about, as they do in Northern Ireland, 
when these stacks of wood are lit on fire. Here you see a bonfire from several years ago in Northern Ireland. Uh, these fires are incredibly strong and intense. They melt windows of buildings close to them. Uh, fire personnel try to douse buildings close to the bonfires to make sure they stay safe, but they dare not douse the bonfire itself because that would be a cultural affront for people within the Protestant Unionist Loyalist community. So what we're trying to do is ascertain risk before it gets to this point, before it becomes a flaming inferno. So as I mentioned, what I did in confronting evil was look at all the models of risk assessment that existed at the time. And it was something like 23 or 24 models. And from those, I wanted to distill the risk factors that we had the best evidence for. And I was less interested in anecdotal evidence and I was more prone to privilege quantitative evidence. What do we have the data support for that suggests this risk factor is an important one for us to look, look at? And based on that, I came up with four categories of structural and systemic factors of risk related to governance, memory or conflict history, economic conditions, and social fragmentation. So I wanna take each of these one by one and talk about them with a case study of the US. First, in terms of governance, we don't have time today to go through each of the five factors related uh, under the category of governance, but if I'm looking at a country to try to, degree to, to ascertain the degree of risk that their governance exposes them, exposes them to, I'm looking at things like regime type. We know democracies that are committed to the protection of minority rights tend to be the safest regimes. I'm looking at state legitimacy issues. Do citizens view the state and the power holders in the state as legitimate? And do they view their demands as legitimate? How strong are weak or state structures? Education, garbage removal, uh, basic infrastructure issues. Is there a lot of identity-based polar factionalism in a country? And then finally, does a country engage in systematic state-led discrimination? For our purposes with the US, I wanna focus on the first two of these issues having to do with the strength of our democratic institutions or lack of strength and the degree to which the state, those democratic institutions are perceived as legitimate or illegitimate. To place it, in a broad uh, global context, here you see the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Uh, I was teaching in Berlin, Germany at that time, 1989. I'm not taking credit for the fall of the wall in any, any respect whatsoever. I was there, I was teaching. I was part of these crowds that went to Checkpoint Charlie and went to the uh, walls and, and watched these come down in 1989. And it ushered in an incredible um, I'd say 10 to 15 year period of tremendous democratic growth across the country, across the world. Countries that had previously been authoritarian, autocratic regimes, many cases in which minority rights were not protected, were not promoted, were making some pretty incredible movements toward democracy. So it was an explosion of democracy globally unlike anything we've seen in recent modern history. Unfortunately, that explosion took a different turn about 10 years ago, and it's a turn that we continue to see um, increasing in the depth of what is called democratic deconsolidation or democratic backsliding, in that more and more countries begin to step back from democracy, begin to retreat into autocracy, begin to retreat into authoritarian regimes. So the world that we thought would be created with the fall of the Berlin Wall, this growth of democracy and the, the blossoming of democracy around the world was incredibly short-lived. And today, when we look at the uh, data related to democracies and we look at things, we measure countries on things like how well the government functions, how much freedom of expression and belief there is in a country, how the rule of law is manifested in a country. You'll see that uh, in this graphic from Freedom House that last year, 
41 established democracies, 25 of them suffered overall declines. These include countries like Poland, Hungary, Thailand, China, Russia, India, Israel, Great Britain, and as you'll see in the graphic, the United States. So every region of the world, we saw democracy in retreat last year. And again, this has been a trend we've seen over the past decade. We've seen democracies in decline. And as democracies have gone in decline, we've seen the rights of minority peoples more consistently under attack, under attack and less well protected. Here's another measure of democracy around the world from The Economist. This is their 2020 index. Here you'll see that the only full democracies listed are a few Scandinavian countries in Canada. Uh, you see uh, several countries listed as flawed democracies, including the US. The US was first classified by The Economist, and this is based, again, quantitatively on 60 different indicators. The US was first classified as a flawed democracy in 2017, and has been classified as a flawed democracy every year since. But what we see in 2020 is every region of the world experienced a democratic rollback. No region was protected from it. And what we see in these type of democratic rollbacks or retreats or declines is they tend to happen very slowly. Most of these aren't over, overnight overthrows of democratic regimes. They are cases of democracy taking steps small steps back, 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 and back, where every step seems like it's not that big of a deal. But the cumulative impact over time is the death of democracy and the decline of democratic institutions. In 2016, Evan Osnos is a journalist who compared it to reading a book in twilight, that as you're reading a book and the sun starts to go down, your eyes adjust and adjust and adjust and you can still read. But at some point, you can't read any longer. It's completely dark. And this is how we think about the death of democracy is that generally it happens bit by bit by bit. We adjust, we adjust, we adjust, and then democracy is gone. Democratic institutions have been compromised. We certainly have seen the impact of this uh, in the US. Um, you'll see here to the right that uh, only 18% of Trump voters believe that President Biden was a legitimate winner of the 2020 presidential election. We have a huge proportion of our country who do not believe that the setting president legitimately won the 2020 election. That's a significant challenge both to the legitimacy of the office of the president but also to the demands that the office of the president makes. And it's a, it's a question of legitimacy for government that we see not just at the federal level, not just at the state level, but we see it creeping into questions of legitimacy even at the local level. And one of the things I wanna be careful to point out is that while it's very easy to focus much of our attention in this regard on the recent Trump administration, these problems of legitimacy existed long before Trump. In fact, all the risk factors I'm gonna talk about, none of those were created by the Trump administration. They were there long before Trump. Some of them have been there since the birth of our country. They've been through successive democratic regimes, republic regimes, and so on. The Trump administration accelerated much of that risk incredibly within a short period of time there was tremendous acceleration of risk, but the risk had been there even before the Trump administration came into office. And here you see from the Eurasian group, just looking since 1990 in the US, with adults asked how much confidence you yourself have in the presidency, you'll see by the early 90s, that figure had dropped below 50%. And it very seldom in any year since the early 90s has gone back above that. So we've always had these challenges of legitimacy that certainly have been exacerbated in the past several years. So in the Stanley Center report, what I had argued is that the guardrails built into American constitutional democracy have eroded and degraded 
not just over the past three years, but under years and years of partisanship, polarization, and the pursuit of power, and that this has led to a disintegration of trust and faith in US democratic institutions. And when we have that disintegration, that's something that directly elevates and escalates the risk for mass violence. And I can say, uh, you know, just anecdotally for what it's worth, that even as a, a university professor, and, and now I've been teaching close to 35 years, it's been disheartening to see in the past several years the number of students who no longer look at government service as a legitimate opportunity for them. Not because they can't have access to it, but simply because they question, is it worth it? Do people trust the institutions enough? Are the institutions and the, peop and the power holders in those institutions trustworthy enough for me to want to commit a professional career to? I think the second issue that I focus on in terms of risk has to do with conflict history. And here, I, I think two recognitions. One is that every country has some degree of conflict history in its background. But I think secondly, in this risk factor, I'm less concerned with what that conflict history is. And I'm more concerned with how that conflict history is remembered. How is it taught? How is it processed? How is it understood? What have countries been through before? And how does that inform their present understanding of who they are? Because one of the things we know about the past is that it's always going to intrude in the present. And especially when it's a past that has been unaddressed, when it's a past that has not been redressed, when is it a past that has not been repaired, no attempt has been made to make victims of the past whole, all of those things find their ways into the fabric of the present. So we're looking at things like history of identity related tensions, racial, ethnic, religious, tribal, and so on, prior genocides or politicides in a country, past cultural trauma that some members of the country have experienced that directly inform their understanding of the presence, present, a legacy of vengeance, record of serious violations of international human rights and law. And I think this has become increasingly important as a risk factor around the world because of the influence of social media. Uh, many of us today are probably on this, in this uh, Zoom together, probably old enough to remember vaguely at least the birth of social media. And the great promise of it was, it was gonna be a force for freedom and democracy. That people who did not have voice before, now would have voice because of social media. They didn't have to go through a peer reviewed journal. They didn't have to be a power holder that there was a democratization of voice that social media would make possible. And it has done that to some degree. But what we've also seen social media unregulated do is that unregulated social media has amplified disinformation. It has an incited violence. And again, it's lowered levels of trust in media and democratic institutions. And I think it pushes, you know, I think January 6th and the role of social media pushes us, or at least pushes me to ask the question of, is freedom of speech an absolute right? Or is it a qualified right? In other words, are there some examples of speech that we qualify and say that speech is so divisive, it's so insightful, it's so hateful that its freedom has to be qualified because of the potential it, prevent, it presents for inciting violence and lowering the levels of trust here that we've talked about. Um, I've seen this uh, firsthand just through uh, personal experience. I'm a child of the South, born and raised in Georgia. And I came of age at a time in the 60s and early 70s where the South had rebranded what we know as the Civil War. 
And this had started as early as March 1955. You see an editorial here reprinted in the Saturday Evening Post. And the South's response to Brown versus Board of Education, the 1954 Supreme Court decision that mandated desegregation in all public uh, federal facilities, part of the South's response was to say, here again, the North is aggressively trying to change the way of life in the South. And so part of the, the rebuilding of the narrative that happens in the South in the 1950s after the Brown decision is to say, well, let's go back and look at the Civil War. That was really a war of Northern aggression. Just like the civil rights legislation is still a war of Northern aggression. And this is more than simply a rebranding of something. This is what generations of school children, including myself, were taught through elementary school, middle school, high school, we were taught about the war of Northern aggression. I went to college in Kentucky, um, not that far away from Georgia, but a world, world apart in some ways. And I took my first history class and the professor kept speaking about this thing called the Civil War. I'd never heard of it. I didn't know what he was talking about. I looked around to see if other people were confused. Most of the students weren't, but that's actually a common experience for me in a classroom, but everyone else seemed to be on top of it. But what he was talking about was what I had been taught was a war of Northern aggression. And here you see, this is a, a monument uh, from a local town here in Woodstock, Vermont, a monument to the people who lost their lives in the war of rebellion of 1861 to 1865. So memory is shaped by the people who have the power to shape memory in education, memorials, monuments, religion, politics, and so on. As I looked at the US, my direct concern in terms of risk assessment is that we live in a country that is purposefully blind, willfully blind to the violations of the past and its direct impact on the present. We're a country founded on the twin evils of the extermination of one people, the removal and physical destruction of indigenous people so we could have their land and the enslavement of another people, the importation of Africans upon whose backs literally the world's strongest economy was built. There is no, in my opinion, understanding of America and who we are today without that understanding of what we did, who we did it to, how we did it, did it to build the country we have today. But by and large, in education, in public discourse, social discourse, we're willfully blind to those realities. And I think a large part of the racial reckoning that we've seen over the past summer and we continue to see is a recognition that we have never made right with that history. We have never confronted that history. We have never dealt with the pain that history has imposed and still imposes on people. And it is a past that directly intrudes into our present. I think a third uh, set of risk factors I'd look at, which honestly we have the lowest level of quantitative support for, but we're continuing to develop in this area, has to do with economic conditions. Uh, what's the level of economic development in a country? To what degree is there economic discrimination? How much macroeconomic stability is there? Uh, I've worked in my work at the Auschwitz Institute with government officials, you know, thousands from over 95 countries around the world. But one of the countries we were active with was Venezuela. And we knew long before Venezuela fell apart that one of our significant risk concerns was a Venezuelan economy built almost exclusively on oil. And the concern was if the price of oil ever drops precipitously, what is that going to do to Venezuela's economy? And the price of oil did drop, it crushed Venezuela's economy, and it opened up all these other fault lines that were exposed because of that lack of macroeconomic stability. We look at economic deterioration, we look at the growth of informal economies and black markets. These are all things that we can look at in terms of risk. 
Certainly, uh, COVID-19 has had some devastating impact on economic conditions worldwide. We still have no idea of how economically destructive the pandemic has been. And I think it's gonna be years before we recognize that it's destruction. We know that it has sent most countries into recession, many countries into depression. We know that that has not been spread equally across race, ethnicity, gender, and age. Uh, in America, we know it's been a she session in large part that the impact of COVID economically has been most severely felt among females. We've seen escalations in unemployment, global economic depression, uh, desperation that's led to increases in human trafficking, increases in human enslavement. And as we see with the vaccine rollout, just the unequal access to social care and health care that people have across the US. But most strikingly for us, is the vast economic inequality. And this is one of the things I tried to argue in the paper is political scientists will generally say to you, if a country has strong economic development, political violence is very, very, very rare. And even in the run up to the election, I was back and forth with other people in the field who kept saying, there's not gonna be any political violence. America's too strong economically. And I thought then, and I really think now, that they were completely missing the boat on this, that it's not the general level of economic development that was a concern or that was a safety factor. It was the tremendous economic inequality that was gonna be part of the driver, I felt. And if you see here on the graph, among the G7 countries, we have the highest level of income inequality among all those countries. Most striking is the black-white economic income inequality, which as you see in the graph on the right, has pretty well held the same since 1970. While both whites and blacks have increased in um, income, the gap, the disparity between the two hasn't closed to any significant degree whatsoever. So when I looked at issues of economic conditions, my concern was that what happens when there's economic inequality is groups can, who are on the downside of that can resort to violence to try to redress the inequality and groups on the upside could resort to violence to try to hold on to the privileges that, that went with their economic standing. And the fourth and final characteristic I wanted to look at was social fragmentation. And here, what we're looking at is in a socially cohesive society, you may have different identity groups, racial, ethnic, gender, tribal, religious, however they're defined. You have a lot of different identity groups, but they have found ways to coexist. They have found ways to work together. They have found ways to move their societies forward. That's a socially cohesive society. The opposite of that is a society that has deep social fragmentation it is divided by identity, some form of identity, racial, religious, ethnic, uh, political, economic, some form of identity divides it at almost every level. So in the uh, field, we talk about these societies as what we call deeply divided societies. And the basic characteristic of a deeply divided society is that social identity is central your group identity is central, that the focuses are on the differences between us rather than the similarities. But the real conflictual characteristic of deeply divided societies is not only that social identity is central, but that social identity is polarizing, that social identity leads to deep divisions, it leads to differences in the quality of life, it leads to communities of fear and communities of isolation. And I'll give you a quick example before we move on. In Northern Ireland, when I taught there, I would often ask my university students, 18, 19, 20 years of age, when did you first meet one, someone from the other side? If you're Protestant, when did you first meet a Catholic? If you're Catholic, when did you first meet a Protestant? 95% of the time, they said to me, the first time I met someone from the other faith tradition, 
was when I came to university. 18 years of their life in complete segregation, complete isolation, segregate communities that led to communities of fear. In the US, um, we are used to thinking about our states as red states um, or blue states, red being Republican, blue being Democrat. But a recent study here from Harvard, some of you saw this in the New York Times, looked at that state by state segregation and said, you know, that segregation exists at a micro level. It exists in communities, it exists in neighborhoods. And here you see a graphic map of Portland showing that, as you see here, we effectively segregate ourselves to a large degree. We live next to, we live with, we live in community and neighborhoods with people who share our political beliefs to a large part, as we see here from voting behavior. So that segregation, uh, political segregation, certainly in the US, runs very deep. And what we're concerned about in these deeply divided societies is that those deep divisions, whether they're political, racial, ethnic, whatever they're built on, they're always there. It's like a fault line in California. It's there. It, you may be stable at times. You may not feel anything moving. Everything may be fine, but you live on a fault line. And one day that fault line will be exposed and you'll feel the effects of that. I think we have several fault lines in the US. I think this past summer, we saw the fault line of race. It's always there. It's been there since the beginning of our country. And that fault line is going to be exposed at different times. And the police brutality of this past summer exposed that fault line. And as Adrian Gwelke says, in a deeply divided society, this is the concern is that these fault lines will occasionally be exposed and you'll see violence between the segments in that society. And certainly in the US, we've seen on, on March 2nd, the FBI director said, the domestic terrorism threat is metastasizing in the US. I think anyone who works in law enforcement, federal, state, local will tell you that the concern in terms of terrorism has always been domestic terrorism but it's not where we put our money and attention because it's much easier to sell the threat of an international terrorist over a domestic terrorist, even though domestic terrorism has been and still is and will be for the foreseeable future, the most significant terrorist threat. So as I thought about social fragmentation in these cases, um, to me, this was the biggest concern. I saw leading into the election is that it's not just that we have groups with different social identities. It's not just that those groups are polarized, but now those groups have come to see in, in each other an existential threat. And as someone who works in genocide studies, this is our biggest red flag. When a group sees another group as a threat to their existence, Maybe the threat is symbolic, that the other group is a threat to my language, and that's a symbolic exist existential threat. But maybe the threat is physical, it's realistic, that the other group is a threat to me economically because they'll get my jobs. The other, other group may be a threat to me existentially just in terms of physical existence. And I think what we had seen leading up to January 6th was this zero sum game being played out that any advances for another racial group were a threat to whites. Any advances for another religious group or non-religious group were a threat to Christians. And I, I've thought often about January 6th and I often come back to the sense that the threat being faced was a threat to privilege. Uh, Taylor Branch is a civil rights uh, historian who said the challenge of the civil rights movement in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s was it pushed Americans to say, white Americans to say, am I going to choose whiteness or democracy? Will I choose Christianity or democracy? Am I choosing privilege that I hold or democracy? And I think much of what we saw on January 6th 
were people who felt and had been told that the privileges they held as white Christian people were under threat, that their whiteness and their religious identity was under existential threat. And unfortunately, that's the flesh and blood consequence of living in a deeply divided society. So as I wrap up, I'll say that, you know, I sat, as, as most of you did on January 6, watching the news unfold and hearing person after person, including President-elect Biden, say, this is not who we are. This is not who we are. And I understand that sentiment from the perspective of this is not who we want to be. This is not who we aspire to be. But I think January 6 was an exact reflection of this is who we are. This is absolutely who we are. There was nothing, uh, again, unusual about it. This is who we've become. This is who we are. I would say, and, and this is something I've thought about over the past few years as well, that if risk analysts like me were noticing the types of trends we've seen in the US, in a Latin American country, in an Eastern European country, in an African country, we absolutely would have been raising concerns saying, this country is on the verge of something horrible happening. But here in the US, those type of statements were often treated as alarmist because it's us. We certainly couldn't do this. This could not be who we are. And I think the cold recognition is this is who we are. We're not a failed or a failing state. We can still perform the basic functions the state needs to function, but we're a fragile one. We're a flailing one. We're closer to a breakdown than a breakthrough. And I don't mean to sound necessarily overly pessimistic about this, but I, you know, I do think I agree with James Baldwin when he says that not everything that's faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. The only way to solve a problem is admitting that you have one. And we have one. We have a big problem of a deeply divided society, a society of escalating risk for massive violence. And those problems have not gone away because President Biden is now in office. Many of the, all of those problems are structural systematic problems that existed long before him and will exist unfortunately long after him. The problem of domestic terrorism is a problem that just continues. It's a bigger problem today than it was on January 6th in terms of the threat it poses. Because once we engage in political violence, it's much easier to do it again. So once we see the scenes of what we saw on January 6th, that opens the door for that to happen again. And I take note of, of President Biden's recent address where he said, your children and grandchildren are going to be doing their doctoral thesis on the issue of who succeeded, autocracy or democracy. That's what's at stake. We've got to prove democracy works. And the US has had incredible moments of making democracy work well. We've also had some very heartbreaking moments of democracy not working well. And the democratic institutions that we entrust with much of the protection of all of our rights have not worked for many groups of people in the US for a long time. And much of that again has been exposed over this past year or so. But I think the challenge in front of us, and I wanna finish with this because it's not, I don't wanna present a problem that you know, it's insurmountable. It's not, but we've got a mountain of hard work ahead of us because the challenge is we've got to prove democracy works. And right now there isn't a ton of proof of that. So we have a mountain of hard work to try to reestablish trust in governance, to try to have some form of economic equality in the country, to try to come to grips with a painful history of conflict that has victimized people of color in the building of this country and to try to bring together some type of social cohesion in place of the social fragmentation that divides us so deeply. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll turn it back over to Amanda now and she'll take us to the next part of our discussion.
Thank you so much for your presentation and for sharing the work that you've done to give us insight into the risk factors to be aware of and to understand how to move forward and also the imperative of moving forward. Um, your call to awareness is something that looms large in our own political and social landscape in the United States and watching the unfoldment of the um, Black Lives Matter uprising this summer, witnessing our own anarchistic jurisdiction here in Portland, Oregon has been an important wake up call for many of us. So to respond to Dr. Waller's comments, I have the pleasure of introducing Mike Brand and Jess Murray. Um, and um, I, I hope that you have accessed some of our uh, materials so that you can get their full bio. I don't have time to read everyone's full bio and their introductions, but they certainly have um, amazing stories to share. Um, Jess is going to go first. She's an award-winning communications specialist who worked for the Search for Common Ground. Um, and all over the world doing peace building work. Um, she is now the CEO and co-founder of Wicked Saint Studio, where she designs interactive story games that prompt behavior change and real world action, and that encourage uh, renegotiation of identity and how to work um, collaboratively. So um, she, I'll just let me introduce Mike and then I'll turn it over to you, Jess. Um, and Mike is a human rights um, atrocities prevention and peace building professional with over a decade of experience in policy, advocacy, organizing, and informal education. He's worked um, for various NGOs in the United States and Rwanda, South Sudan, fieldwork in the Democratic Republic of, the Con of Congo and Uganda. So we have two great respondents here. I'll turn it over to Jess. And if you have questions, please toss them into the Q&A and hopefully we'll have some time to look at them at the end of their remarks. Take it away, Jess. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you, Dr. Waller, for sharing your presentation. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, so really briefly, um, again, Amanda did a great job at why I'm here talking to you. So, so yes, I'm currently the CEO of Wicked Saint Studios. We create interactive story games that are wickedly fun and actively good. Um, before that, I was working with Search for Common Ground. Um, if you're not familiar with Search, Search is um, one of the world's largest dedicated peace building organizations with offices in 34 countries. 90% um, of the staff is actually local to the areas that they work in. So everything from, you know, um, prevention of mass atrocity work to reconciliation after genocide, counting violent extremism, security sector reform. Um, they do a lot of that kind of stuff. And so it's funny because people would say like, hey, like, you know, peace builder to game designer, that seems like a big kind of switch up. Um, but for me, it was really just a natural progression of following the same question of how do we mobilize millions of young people around what we call common ground activism. So um, to basically attack the problem instead of the person. Um, and I'm gonna explain this really briefly before I get into my response, because I think it will help explain um, my response a little bit. But so behavior change often, often happens not by giving people information, but through experiences. And so stories are a, hugely powerful tool um, to do that because you can kind of give people this vicarious experience that they wouldn't have any other way besides listening or reading or watching the story of another person or even fictional um, can really kind of move people emotionally in that way. Um, but oftentimes it takes more than an experience to actually activate someone to take action in the real world. So social cognitive theory says that the number one indicator whether someone will take action or not is um, actually self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is your belief in your ability to accomplish a goal. Um, and uh, uh, meta-analysis studies have shown that gameplay actually significantly increases self-efficacy because self-efficacy is more than just like, hey, like you can do it, cheerleading on the sideline, you gain self-efficacy by mastery. And the cool thing about designing games is you design these core game loops. And so, and every time a player goes around a core game loop, they get a little bit better at whatever task, whatever the task or action is. Um, and so with interactive story games, we believe we have the next evolution of media-based behavior change because you're not just 
vicariously, you know, having this experience, you are the main character, you're deciding how to respond often in complex situations, and then you're experiencing the consequences of your actions, but in a safe place and with, and with feedback, um, and hopefully you're having fun while you're at it. And so um, that's why, so that's where we are right now. We are um, building interactive story games. We're actually working with Niantic Labs, um, we're the first team selected for their Black Developers Initiative. Um, and so we're creating an interactive story game driven by discovery and real life actions. So uh, using geolocation and AR as well, where players will actually be able to practice being a hero within the game, and then we're gonna prompt them to be a hero in real life. Okay, so that's my kind of spiel of the background where we're coming from. Um, so what I find so interesting about um, Dr. Walla's report is really, um, so what I'm gonna talk about is really kind of focused on um, two, so it's focused really on memory, um, on the memory portion of his report and kind of brings together the social fragmentation part, a little bit of the economy, um, but really is kind of focused on these two kind of things that he took out within memory. And so, um, so let me start by saying, that if anyone knows me, I mean, if you know me for the last three minutes and you're probably not surprised because it's powerful to me because it talks, because memory speaks to stories. Um, and stories are so important, both in the past and the present because it's how we understand the world around us. And if we don't have all the facts of a story or if something happens that doesn't quite fit into this, um, the understanding of this world that we've built, we tend to, fill gaps in the story with our own assumptions and with our own perception, um, which can be very dangerous. And that's kind of where we're finding ourselves. And so uh, Dr. Waller's talking about with this, um, any kind of in the, in the report, he draws it out to kind of two stories and memories of how America got started. So you have this one story of America, it was created um, born of equality and freedom and fight against tyranny. And then you have this other story of it was the destruction, this genocidal destruction of an indigenous race to steal land and then ens enslavement of black people to make that land profitable. And those two stories, from those two stories, I see two issues arising from that. So one on reconciliation and one um, about feeding a current narrative of non-whites being inferior. And so start with reconciliation. So we know that for reconciliation to start, to begin for healing to start, there has to be an acknowledgement of pain and wrongdoing. It's just like the most basic thing. And, and you'll even see this and personal relationships as well, right? Like you, like you can't move forward until someone has acknowledged like that was wrong and that hurt me. And then you can start the forgiveness process, right? Um, and, and this is what, and I um, actually wrote a whole article just about this um, when this first happened with George Floyd. It's like right now, uh, many, um, many blacks in America, like we just like, we just need you to acknowledge, you don't need to explain it, but like we just need you to acknowledge what happened um, and the pain that it has caused. And so when you, this is the same thing with like the history of, you know, the United States and where we came from. And it's like, why is this so hard? Why is it so hard to acknowledge what really happened in the past? And um, I really think it comes down to identity. And I know Dr. Wallach just talked about this. Um, what I'm seeing, and I forgot to mention, I'm actually based in Southern Oregon, so Medford, Oregon. So I saw an Ashlander out there somewhere. Um, and uh, I graduated from Ashland High School. But Southern Oregon is a very kind of conservative, call it the Bible belt of the well, of the of the West. And so it's been interesting for me to have these kind of conversations and, and see what's going on here. And I think a lot of times what it comes down to is again this sense of identity. Um, that I'm proud to be an American. I'm, you know, home of the free, home of the brave, where there's an opportunity, you know, there's always an opportunity, where innovation juggernauts. And so when you're saying, when you when it when it feels like you're attacking America, when you're saying America is racist, when you're saying America's systems are racist, um, the, if my identity is closely tied to America, 
anything you say bad about America feels like you're saying it bad. You're saying bad things about me. And if I feel like you're attacking America and I feel like you're attacking me and who I am and my identity. Um, and so, and I think that there's ways around that, but you have to get really creative. And I think memory and actually going through historically what happened and that doesn't make you a bad person, but it's, in, but it's, an, but creating that safe space for people to really learn about the truth of, of our history and what happened. And so, okay, so the first one, I said reconciliation. The second one um, is about this, you know, these two stories of memory really feeds into this narrative that um, being non-white is inferior. So when you believe a country, you know, when you believe this country is founded on equality and freedom, and you believe that everyone here has the opportunity to succeed, if they just work hard enough, and then you see certain demographics that are not succeeding, um, you have to be able to fit it into the world that you understand, right? And so, um, and so therefore it must be, so the problem therefore must be them. So they must not have worked hard enough. There must be something wrong with them or even criminal with them because the world you understand is a world where everyone works hard enough, everyone's got a shot to succeed. And so when you see these graphs of wealth disparity between blacks and whites, again, if you don't have the, you could, you could believe, you could create your own narrative, your own story for this is why things are the way they are versus having the correct memory and conflict history of what happened. So you, like now the reasons are, um, you start looking into, you know, black codes and redlining and um, how, you know, federal government subsidized um, certain living and and where does um, and wealth and property ownership in this country is so cl closely tied. And then when you and then you go even farther and you say, okay, where how is education funded in this country? Oh, through property taxes. And you see this loop that it's just so hard to get out of. Um, but if you don't have the history to that, then um, then you can create your you can fill in the gaps and create your your own narrative. And it's not just here in the US. Um, this is something that we're seeing in the NGO world, very much so, you know, like who writes, <laughs> who writes the grants, who funds the grants, um, we, who are the develop, what is the developing country? Um, quick side story here. Um, I was helping um, one of my Belgian colleagues and Congolese colleagues write a piece around race and reconciliation. Um, on the European side of things. And I noticed in the piece, they didn't write about any of the atrocities that were committed by Belgium at the time. It was, you know, cause before they, they mentioned, yes, they talked about colonization, but before colonization, one of the worst genocides in history happened in the Congo and it was committed under King Leopold's Belgium. And um, it's, you know, we're talking about severed hands, we're talking about kidnapping children. I mean, it was horrible. And as soon as I brought that part up, there started to become tension, right? Because now I'm messing with legacy and, and heritage. But that those memories are so important because this underlying narrative and understanding and belief that, um, that Africa is worse on their, they're just worse in governance and they have issues. And so therefore migrant and immigrants moving to Europe are somehow inferior. That everything that happens in um, former colonized countries are, are inferior. And it's like, wait a minute, let's, let's get the history right of why are they fragile states to begin with? And, and, and who did what? Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm getting up. So, so those are the things on that, that, that first kind of uh, point that Dr. Uh, Waller made within his section of memory. The last kind of thing I'll touch on um, that I found really interesting was about the note about the study that someone did a study between Fox News and MSNBC, and they found that Fox News was five more times likely to um, use the word hate and they hate us or you 
or Trump or Christians. Um, so one thing that's really interesting about that is someone who does social change communication and we talk about um, the stages of transformational change, like how hard it is to get someone to change their mind and the steps to that. I just found it really interesting because it's actually, it would take a lot more steps and be a lot more difficult to get someone to believe that someone else hates them, but it'd be a lot easier to get someone to believe that someone hates them. And I think that's what it comes down to is if you can get someone to believe that others hate them, then you've made them an enemy. And so now we're talking about the, the social fra um, fragmentation. But, it's, but a lot of that focus was on conservative news. And I wanna take a quick second to address more liberal news. Um, and I just to say my own personal opinion is that most television news is political comment commentary, even though we call it news, but, but same thing. So if I'm, so I'm also talking about, you know, more liberal leaning news sites, but also, um, political commentators who are more liberal and how, um, how I've seen some of their treatment of the other side and how it can add to this social, uh, fragmentation. And so, um, I was once at a conference. I was in, it was actually in Armenia of all places, um, but it was, it was a humor and games conference. And I was having this debate with this comedian who was, and he, what he told me was, he's like, he's like, he's like, the only way to get change is for people to understand what idiots they are. He's like, they just need to understand like how they're complete idiots. And then that's the only way, you know, and then we'll start to change things. And finally I was like, well, how is that working for you? And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, how many hearts and minds have you changed by convincing people that they're idiots? And he of course didn't have an answer for me. Um, and so one of the things when we're looking at countering violent extremism, we look at push and pull factors. So things that push people outside of society um, and leave them vulnerable to being recruited, pulled into violent, violent extremist groups. And um, one of the biggest indicators, um, push or push factors is actually shame and, and shaming, um, shaming people. And so we, you know, we have this, we have this kind of <laughs> righteousness and, and, and we've been coming down really hard on, on people. And um, the, the truth is, is that when you, uh, when you feel attacked, um, attack or fear, it makes it almost impossible for you to see the pain of others. And so here we are. And so we, so I feel like there has been a lot of attacking of conservative. We've actually been pushing people that were more moderate and people that have voted for Trump. And the more you make them try to feel bad for it, you're actually pushing them farther and farther away and we're getting more and more um, polarized. And so, and it happens at the beginning, but it also happens at the end. When someone wants, I've been seeing when someone wants to maybe change their mind or say like, actually, maybe that isn't right. We, what I've been seeing is political commentators come in and say like, oh no, you don't get credit for coming in at the 11th hour to change, you know, you don't get to change your mind now. But in reality, we should be celebrating people that change their mind. We should be encouraging a growth mindset because, okay, should they get credit or not? That's really not the point. The point is, is that they have a whole audience of people. They are a credible messenger. They have people that trust what they say. And we should be welcoming with an open hand people who are maybe looking at things like, okay, this doesn't quite feel right um, without them knowing that if they step over towards more enemy territory that they're going to get slapped back because of things that they might have said in the past. And so I know I've talked probably too long. So these are kind of my three main takeaways from this um, across, you know, across this, across memory, uh, this memory section is one is made me think that like, okay, we need to have one ownership, ownership of what actually happened in the past and our history and our memory Two, accountability over shame. So there still needs to be accountability here. And I think we can hold people accountable without shaming them. And then finally, um, is that growth mindset. So, so allow, uh, allow room for growth so that people can be welcomed back into a fold. How do we make a pathway so that people can come back into the fold and be welcomed and celebrated uh, if they change their mind? 
So, um, okay, I'm done for now. Mike or Amanda, I pass it off to you. Thanks, let me just uh, say, you've just given us a wonderful argument in favor for conflict resolution, which of course is my roots. And um, you've just described so much about how conflict resolution fits into the atrocity prevention lens because of that sort of reframing of narratives and understanding the importance of humanity, connecting with the true humanity and moving beyond um, the system of emnification that's so prevalent. So thank you for that gorgeous gorgeous talk and um, response. And I'd love to turn it over to Mike. Thank you. And we'll get back to you with questions at the end. Thanks, Jess. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, uh, Jim. Really appreciate all the comments so far. I'll try to keep mine somewhat brief, although I can't guarantee that, but I'd love to get into discussion or questions or anything after. So I think, you know, the question for today is, you know, can it happen here? And um, as Jim said a little bit, you know, I think that the framing of the question isn't, can it happen here? It's that it's already happened here, right? Like we know our history, or at least some, some of us do, the history is up for debate among some folks, I guess. Um, but we know our history of past genocide and mass atrocities. And we know that any analysis that, you know, focuses on genocide and atrocities says that, you know, past violence is a strong indicator of future violence. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the risks. And I think, um, you know, when we talk about risks of mass atrocities, you can think of it in some ways similar to the risk of COVID-19, right? Everyone's at risk of getting COVID. Um, some people have certain underlying conditions that are more at risk than others, and people's behavior can put them at even greater risk. With mass atrocities, there are underlying risk factors that a country can have that could put them at more risk of atrocity, um, and certain actions that countries and key actors in that country can take to put them at even greater risk. But alternatively, just as there's things that you can take to prevent you from getting COVID, or the actions that you can take, um, there are actions that countries can take to prevent mass atrocities, you know, and there's these long-term prevention efforts and short-term prevention efforts. Long-term prevention or upstream prevention, as you know, most people refer to it as, um, seeks to address like these root causes and drivers of violence. The short-term efforts are often reactionary. It's when a situation is on the brink of violence or if there's a potential flashpoint, we act in, in a way to try to prevent atrocities in very targeted and specific ways. But these efforts are only short-term because they're band-aid fixes, right? They, they, they're not solving the underlying issues. Those underlying issues are still there, which means that those risk factors will still remain. Um, but you're hoping to at least stave off some immediate violence. So in the context of the US, you know, we can think of this as short term prevention efforts that may have been instituted leading up to the 2020 election, because many people were worrying that it could be a flashpoint of violence. Um, and people were worrying that it wouldn't be a peaceful transfer of power. You know, as we saw on January 6th, you know, some, some of those uh, warnings, you know, played out. Um, long term prevention, you know, looks more at these bigger um, issues that address, you know, the, the, the wide spanning issues in a country. Some of these both J Jess and Jim talked about, you know, the economic and societal inequities, dealing with governance issues and corruption, um, addressing problems with law enforcement, among other things. And so these long-term prevention efforts would also focus um, exactly on, you know, what Jim ended his paper with. I mean, he said, you know, indeed the most important work uh, is the in the contemporary United States is the work of peace, the work of turning strangers and enemies into friends and allies. The hard work of preventing mass violence is not what makes the headlines, but it's what prevents the worst headlines from being made. And that's really, you know, this long term upstream prevention work that we need to be doing in the US, um, also referred to as peace building, although many folks who do this work in the US don't actually refer to their own work as peace building for a number of reasons that we could talk about. Um, we need more cross cultural dialogues, we need more cross communal dialogues, we need to be engaged with different groups. Um, there's so many in-groups in this country that have been insulated and for many, many years, and there's not enough of this conversation that's happening across these groups. Um, so what are some of the risks, you know, that we're talking about today? You know, Jim's talking a lot about, you know, specific risk factors at a, a quantitative level. Um, I'm just going to talk about some generalized things. So for me, you know, the, one of the greatest risks that I think that we're facing today is the threat from white supremacy and Christian nationalism, right? These are the people who stormed the building on uh, the Capitol building on January 6th. Um, these are the folks who erected gallows to hang Mike Pence um, and wrote you know, quotes of scripture on those same gallows. Um, these are the folks who, after they violently sieged the Capitol building, beat police, vandalized the seat of our democracy, they went on to pray in the Senate chamber. 
Um, I think what's important to understand about the insurrection is that most of the people at the Capitol were, you know, quote unquote, normal people. They were everyday people, moms, dads, sons, daughters. They weren't all part of the Proud Boys, three percenters, Oath Keepers, etc. And these are folks who go to church, they go to work, they go to their kids soccer games. Um, but many of them also believed in the QAnon conspiracy theories. They believed the big lie. Um, many believed that God made Trump president or, or put him in that, that seat. Um, so they listened to all these lies, the disinformation, the propaganda and that was all being fed to them, and they decided to finally take some action. They became violent. They beat you know, police, and they even killed a police officer. Um, this, the same police that for months they were defending during all the Black Lives Matter protests. And you know, some folks were even beating police with an American flag. Um, this is how we see extremism and mass atrocities happen you know, in other countries, like this long process of, of how it gets there, how we get to extremism. Um, it requires normal people to get on board. You know, often when I give these kinds of talks, I, I talk about how you'll always have crazy people with crazy, horrible, dangerous ideas, but you can't commit genocide or mass atrocities with just one person with some crazy ideas. You need a whole bunch of followers who are willing to take action um, and, and actually put those crazy ideas into force. Um, it's bad when we see the normal people take those actions. Um, that's when you know the disinformation and the lies have worked, right? There's lots of disinformation that's out there that ends up going nowhere. But when you see it come into power and come into force, that's when it's a real problem. You know, take, for example, the genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda. Um, we commemorate this genocide starting tomorrow and for the next 100 days. Uh, but many of the people who participated in those killings were normal people, right? They, they weren't all members of the military or militia. They were just everyday folks. Um, and the people who bought into the QAnon propaganda and other kinds of disinformation that's out there are no different than the folks who bought into the, the Hutu hate propaganda. Um, you have people who literally believe that Democrats were eating babies. You had others who believe that despite losing the election very clearly, Donald Trump was still going to be sworn in as president. And you had many who believed that they could stop the steal by storming the Capitol. Um, you know, if you think about it, for, for some of these folks, you know, if you, if you truly believe that your God anointed Trump to be president, and this is the, the you know, the will of the Lord, um, you know, it, it's, it's easy to see that some people would do anything in their power to, you know, carry out God's will. You know, we see this kind of extremism that happens, you know, around the world in other countries as well. Um, so it's not really a stretch to think that people who are capable of believing all of these things are capable of committing mass violence um, at a, a larger level if they were actually drawn to that. Um, and we should reflect on the fact that the insurrection could have been much, wor much worse than it was, right? Um, it could have been much more violent. And if there was a significant number of members of Congress who were killed or kidnapped, it could have done serious damage to our democracy, more so than what the insurrection has already done to our, our democracy. So one of the other challenges that I think we're facing, which you know, we've talked about a little bit here, but I just want to highlight a few things, is you know, this rising disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, and dangerous speech that's flooding this country. And I, I use each one of those terms specifically because they, they are different things. Um, sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't, but it's important that we focus on all the pieces of this puzzle. Um, so, you know, networks, talking heads, social media memes, you know, using this hate and divisive language to rile up their audiences. And as Jim pointed out in his paper, um, you know, there was a, a much larger influence from the, the right wing media than there was on social media, despite the fact that we keep talking about social media's influence. Um, and many of these actors, you know, they manufacture outrage, right? So a lot of the times they'll actually misreport on an original issue, and then they report on the outrage that happened because of their manufactured report, and then they continue to report the outrage over and over and over. And so it's like a, a vicious cycle that, that happens where um, an outrage that maybe didn't exist, you know, to begin with was manufactured by one of these individuals or networks, um, and then they keep piling on with the story. So the disinformation about the election being stolen, you know, had real consequences as we saw on January 6th and beyond though, right? You have a, a whole swath of unnecessarily restrictive voting laws that are being introduced across the country, many of which are based on the big lie um, from the election. And so it's not the, the, the influence and the, the impact of the big lie didn't stop at January 6th. It doesn't stop with these polls that are showing that people, you know, don't believe that Biden was elected um, you know, officially, but it, it also happens at the state and local level as well, these, these impacts. And dangerous speech that, you know, happened from President Trump and from others 
led to spikes in violence among Latino and Asian communities across the country. We, we've seen, you know, lots of different data points that show this. There's not a direct um, causality relationship there, but there is some kind of correlation with, with those uh, dangerous speech efforts. Um, and, you know, so basically with, with this information, we need to find a way of dealing with this problem at the source, you know, with these media outlets, with these individuals, while still maintaining the freedom of speech. And it's a, it's a delicate balance and it's a difficult balance, but we need to figure out a way to do more to combat the spread of disinformation um, because it, the problems are just going to grow if we don't. And something else I wanted to just talk about when we were talking about memory and we're talking about how people shape the world that they live in and, you know, being in a community that's separate from another community. You know, you may have heard someone say, or maybe you've said it yourself, that one side or another lives in a alternate reality than the other. Um, but it's not really that far off, right? So recent Reuters poll showed that half of Republicans um, don't believe that the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th was violent. Um, and six in 10 Republicans believe that the election was actually stolen from Trump. Not that he lost, not that you know, there was influence from others, that it, the election was actually stolen from him. Um, and you know, these, these memory problems of you know, the Civil War and you know, the war in Northern aggression, all these things, you know, there, there are problems that we've had in this country since the beginning, and they obviously remain today. You know, just a, a quick anecdotal story. It was just last month I saw this online. You know, there was a, a meeting in a, a Florida school district to talk about the renaming of a Robert E. Lee High School. And there were multiple white members of the community that stood up to speak out in support of keeping the name. You know, one woman I heard say something along the lines of, you know, well, I was taught that Africans sold their, Afri their African brothers and sisters into slavery. So it's really their fault. It's not the fault of people like Robert E. Lee. Um, and other people tried to justify slavery by saying that slavery was condoned in the Bible um, to mixing this kind of white supremacy with Christian nationalism a little bit. And we saw this play out, you know, in, in real time with the 1619 project versus the 1776 commission. Um, so this, you know, this challenge of, you know, you can't really start to engage on this long term peace building work. Um, if the two sides or three sides or four sides, however many sides there are, aren't really even on the same page. In many cases, at least in the United States, they're not even reading the same book. So the, the starting place is so far removed from one another that we have to really get back to basics in some ways. Um, you know, in addition to addressing the spread of this information at the source, we need to do more to affect the public's media literacy and their ability to actually discern the difference between different types of media and what's real and what's not. You know, for many of us who are fortunate enough to, to attend, you know, college, university, uh, maybe get, you know, graduate degree, or whatever, you know, we take for granted that these critical thinking skills, the cross-referencing, the research, you know, these are taught skills. Not everybody just is born knowing how to do this. Um, and especially with the internet today, there's a lot of publications that are out there that look and feel just like real news, but are really either just opinion or some kind of propaganda. Um, so it's a lot more difficult these days to really discern the difference between a real news publication with journalistic integrity and other sources or opinion sources that are out there. Um, so a lot of what I was just talking about, you know, and some of what we talked about generally today is focused on, you know, the people, the general populace and, and, you know, the ability to commit atrocities or a potential to commit atrocities in the U.S., right? Um, but we also have a risk from authority figures, law enforcement, etc., so, you know, we're talking a lot about the violence here at home, but the violence that we do abroad can be connected to the violence that we do at home. And so the U.S.'s history of direct violence, you know, in, in many countries around the world, extraordinary rendition, indefinite detention, torture, extrajudicial executions or killings, um, it's not irrelevant to our conversation. You know, Jim's paper talks a little bit about these unmarked law enforcement officers that were grabbing people off the street in Portland. Um, and, you know, with, that, with detaining them without telling them why, one individual was saying, you know, they, should, they didn't know if they would be seen again. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that we see in some of the most authoritarian regimes around the world, um, disappearances of, of folks and never to be seen again. And we saw President Trump, you know, decry the Black Lives Matter movement as a movement of hate. And we saw a significant increase in the law enforcement that was present during the D.C. Black Lives Matter protests after the murder of George Floyd. Um, and we also saw a large number of law enforcement officers that were walking around and detaining individuals with no identification. You know, some of these individuals look no different than the men who are dressed in these self-identified militia groups. So when we have this blurring of the lines between official law enforcement and, and who's an official law enforcement officer um, with authority versus random people who are dressed as law enforcement officers or similarly, 
it becomes very dangerous because you no longer have that trust in, you know, who's a law enforcement officer who has the right to actually detain you for, you know, an official legal purpose versus random person who looks like a law enforcement officer is able to just grab you off the street and, you know, who, who knows what. Um, you know, and then obviously we have the, the issue of uh, President Trump and, and any others, you know, outright or implicitly, you know, supporting violent white supremacist members and movements. Um, you know, some people have said like playing footsie with these groups. Um, and we saw the significant difference in the violence that was against the Black Lives Matter protesters here in DC and Lafayette Square versus the lack of a police presence and the relative acceptance of the violent insurrectionists at the Capitol. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more that we could talk about, obviously, generally speaking, with police brutality and race, racial profiling, um, and both ha have been and continue to be a, a significant problem in our country. Um, and then you have other things like uh, the former Nuremberg prosecutor, Ben Ferenz, who if you don't know Ben Ferenz, he's like one of the most amazing people in the world. Um, you know, he said, came out and said that the family separation policy at the southern border was a crime against humanity. Um, so we have different examples of this kind of violence that is happening in, in the United States or, you know, from the United States abroad in different ways. Um, one of the last things I'll just say to, to reiterate a previous point before, you know, we get into the discussion, which I'm looking forward to, is, you know, we really just need to focus on bringing people together more. Um, you know, Jim used that the anecdote of you know, talking with uh, folks in the, um, Northern Ireland, you know, Protestants and Catholics not really ever seeing somebody from the other side or the other. When I was in college um, many years ago now, um, I engaged in a, a program with Israelis and there was um, Israeli Jews, there was Arab Israelis, Muslims and Christians as well. And they all said the same kind of thing. You know, we, we, we were taught to hate the other. We didn't know the other. We never met the other. They always referred to each side as the other. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot easier to have bigotry and hate, you know, with somebody that you don't know about, right? The, the ignorance that's there, the disinformation that's there, these lies. Um, and this happens throughout history and it happens with genocide, it's slavery. Um, and we see it today happening with modern day issues of immigration or LGBTQ rights, for instance. You know, just looking at the, the wave of transphobic bills that are being considered, introduced and passing across the country. Um, most of these legislators writing, I bet, had never, um, writing these bills and voting on these bills, I bet have never met somebody who's trans. They never had a conversation with somebody who's trans to try to understand, you know, what, what they've gone through and what their life is like. So, you know, it's much more difficult to hate a group if you interact with them on a daily basis or you get to know them. And so, again, like, you know, I said before, we need to really invest more in these cross-cultural and cross-communal dialogues in different ways across this country. Um, because some of these discussions, you know, we, we need to be able to have with these other groups, or else we'll never get to understand different people and, and where they're coming from. Um, and the only other thing that I'll say, and we can talk more about this uh, during the discussion, is, you know, some of these, these issues that we're, we're talking about um, stem from our governance system, and who is elected into power, whether that's at the state level or at, you know, the federal level in Congress. Um, and there's some things that we can do to address some of these issues, you know, that there's more and more, it seems like extremist candidates that are winning elections and are being, you know, um, brought to the front, you know, things like ranked choice voting, independent redistricting to get rid of gerrymandering um, can, can help with that. And there's bills that are being considered, you know, in Congress right now at the federal level, things like the For the People Act, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, Protecting Our Democracy Act and others that would address some of these issues directly, which I think, you know, obviously is a conversation potentially for another day, but they're really important to consider because without those kinds of steps that we're taking at the national level to deal with some of these issues, um, not much is gonna change. And with that, Amanda, I think I'm done and happy to chat with everybody during the panel. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Thanks to everyone for their for their presentations and responses. It's been such an exciting day. And I think the theme that we're looking at here is just the importance of paying attention to these various different factors. Dr. Waller's research gives us a framework to understand what the risk factors are. And just and Mike's comments help us sort of see the implications of those and the importance of bringing a critical lens so that we can both notice these patterns and also respond to them in some 
some sort of way. Um, we have a few questions in the q and I don't know if you've had a chance panelists to take a look at those questions. Some of them I think have been answered in the course of the conversations as they've evolved and some might be a little bit outside the bounds of what it is that we're capable of answering for today's presentation. But I thought maybe as a closing comment, um, if you wanted to choose one of the questions from the Q&A or think about what next steps might be, because I think that all of us are looking for rays of hope to figure out how we navigate. Yeah, we, you know, we've had this new, we have a new administration, we have a new hope perhaps in government, but those old issues as Dr. Waller described still remain and the threats, <clears throat> excuse me, to democracy are still as present, if not more present than they were in the prior administration. Administration. So uh, maybe we could start with Dr. Waller and then go to Jess and Mike to just um, comment on that. Next steps. Thanks, Amanda. Um, you know, I think Jess and Mike, thank you both for your thoughtful comments on the paper. It's good to know two people have read the paper somewhere. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I think they have both outlined some really helpful ways for next steps forward. And so I'll let them speak more to that. I think I'll address one of the themes that was coming up in the questions was, why are democracies backsliding? What are the root causes? How do we see this happening? So I think I'll address that one just quickly. Um, power holders in government and in society have to at some point ask the question, can I still compete under fully democratic conditions? If their answer to that question is no, power holders will start to break down as many democratic institutions as they need to break down to keep power. I think part of what we're seeing with voter suppression in Georgia is people in power in the legislature saying, I cannot keep power under these current democratic conditions. And they're creating the narrative that the conditions are unfair. But I think anytime we see the move to take votes away from people, those are power holders recognizing, I can't stay in power if the game is played fairly. So I have to rig the game in my favor. I think we see it many, you know, I work often in, in Great Lakes region of Africa and we see pe people in power, presidents and their party deciding to change the constitution so they can be president for life because they recognize that if democracy works the way it's supposed to, it will threaten their positions of power and privilege. So they, work the system to change the democratic conditions for their favor. So I think when we see these democratic backsliding, Poland, Hungary, Thailand, uh, elsewhere, a general theme we see is people in power realizing, I cannot keep power if the game is played fairly. The game has to be played differently. And so that's where we start to see the breakdown of some of the democratic institutions, voting rights, freedom of expression and belief, and so on. Thank you. Jess, do you want to jump in? Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, um, yes, everything to that. And then I was just thinking, you know, about um, next steps. And so I know I had had like, you know, like ownership, accountability, um, and, and growth, but um, I'm thinking maybe just a, maybe a few tips to break it down for um, individuals. So like if you're trying to have these conversations right now across lines of difference, some just some, some tips, because it really starts, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm very much kind of the grassroots person. And so I believe like, yes, we need to change institutions, but institutions are run by people. Um, and so like how, you know, how do we start to shift some of these attitudes and minds and, um, you know, so there's a whole nother track to go off of, of putting people that are different together because there's different power dynamics. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we can get into like contact theory and like how to do that well to get people working together on common issues. Um, but just thinking for a second, like how, um, just some tips for if you're wanting to engage um, across lines of difference, whether it's, you know, around race, religion, um, 
um, you know, orientation, like what, whatever, whatever it is politically, um, some things to do. Um, so one, I think it's really important. And again, let me, well, I'll do it. I'll just, I'll do this. I'm like, there's so many ways we could go, but let's just, let's just do that. So for one, if you're going to engage, um, really encourage you not to assume. Uh, we tend to assume and like, I'm just as guilty. It's like, no, I know exactly why you voted that way. I know exactly why you think that. I know exactly. And the truth is, is I don't. I'm creating my own story, right? And so it's so important when you're going into these conversations, not to assume, to instead ask why. Um, so, and, and a lot of it does take listening um, and trying to really understand what the root is because they might say one thing, but then when you keep asking like, well, well, where did you get your information or, or why, or why do you think that? Or, you know, sometimes they're just regurgitating things that they have heard. And so, and when you scratch the surface a little bit more into why, then you're like, oh, that's interesting. I've actually, there's actually, you know, and now you can actually have, um, speak more to the issue. And so instead of trying to win arguments, try to understand and then set your own objective for what you want to achieve at the end. So, you know, our whole lives we've been taught someone has to lose in order for us to win, but that's not necessarily true. And so if you shift your objective from make them lose, whoever they are, to one, make them an ally, to, um, you know, prevent or stop harm, and three, actually solve a problem, it's going to completely change the way that you treat and engage in these conversations. Um, and, you know, because, again, like the goal is, I need this person to also, not only do I need to understand where they're actually coming from, but I also need them to understand me and actually receive information I have to say, I, information I have. So it's like, how do you build that trust? And it really starts with, you know, not assuming, asking why, and starting to have some more of these strategic conversations um, that don't involve us winning or defeating, you know, that other side. Um, so those are my tips I'll throw out there. Great. Thank you so much. And I just want to emphasize the fact that in, you know, in our conflict resolution classes at Portland State, we always say if there's one thing you take away from this class as a conflict resolution skill, it's curiosity. Because when you enter into those conflicts with curiosity, it shifts the discourse into a way that's far more constructive and it, and it, and it facilitates the kind of bridge building that all three of you are talking about as being necessary. So thank you for that. Mike. Yeah. So I think one of the challenges, and it's a real, it's a challenge, but also an opportunity, is that, as I said very briefly, I kind of brushed over it during my comments, but, you know, in, in the United States, we traditionally haven't had peace building work as it's, you know, normally considered when we do this work abroad. And, you know, generally with like conflict resolution or peace building, there's usually the like third party actors in some way that are acting in a you know, completely nonpartisan, not taking a side, they're a complete third actor, and they're bringing people together to have these kinds of conversations and these dialogues. And it's something that I think is really missing in a lot of ways in this country. You know, we, we see, for instance, you have the Black Lives Matter, you know, moving for Black Lives folks on, on one side of an issue, then you have like blue line folks on the other side. But there's not a lot of dialogue between members of law enforcement and folks that are in these, you know, Black Lives Matter grassroots kind of communities. And that's where I think we need to go. And I'm just using that as a one example, but there's many examples of this, right? Um, and, you know, I think something that we've learned over the last four years in some ways that, you know, is potentially good is that, you know, as, as Jim mentioned a couple of times about these guardrails of democracy, you know, that um, we kind of blew through them. There, you know, there's a lot of things that we took for granted for far too long, a lot of norms, a lot of, you know, existing law that we just, you know, were respecting. And in some ways, the, the envelope was pushed, you know, as far as it could go for some of these issues. And so there's, there's new laws that are being introduced to try to rectify these things for the future. Um, and I think that's something that we need to look at, things like the Protecting Our Democracy Act, which is going to be reintroduced this year. Um, and then on the voter suppression stuff, which, you know, translates across so many different things, because if people can't vote, then they can't get the change that they want to see happen. And, the, you know, it's this big cycle. Um, again, there's other, you know, federal legislation that's being introduced that I think, you know, folks should get on top of before the People Act has already passed the House and is in the Senate right now. 
Um, but there's also at the state level, right? These state level suppression bills happen at the local level. And so I think, you know, the more you could pay attention to these things and speak out against them before they pass, the better. Um, and just, you know, getting people to be, be more of an active role in all of this, right? In having some of these conversations in that Socratic method of just asking questions of people who have different opinions than you and trying to understand where they're coming from or getting them to a place where you would like them to go just by asking them questions. Um, but then also getting involved in the advocacy, um, you know, efforts both at the federal and national, at the state level as well. Thank you. I, I know we're running short on time here, but I so appreciate this opportunity to break down this idea of um, how you prevent mass violence, how you prevent atrocity, because while it's wonderful to have the depth of expertise that Dr. Waller has, the strategies for hope, and this goes to Glenn's question in the, in the, in the Q&A, um, they're very accessible strategies, bringing curiosity to an argument that you would otherwise discount the other person, bringing, you know, a recognition of the destructive nature of shame when you're dealing with someone whose opinions are very um, polarized from your own, and taking action to try and preserve democracy in the places that we can. It's, um, I think that atrocity prevention is rocket science, but there are ways for us to get involved that aren't rocket science, that are just sort of bringing those um, critical perspectives and perspective taking and generosity of heart to bear in the way that we engage in the world around us. And I think that we, you know, as such, there's ways for each of us to plug in uh, to the kind of change processes that are necessary to, to bridge differences and to encourage um, the strength in our systems to support um, democracy and effective governance. And, you know, if, if your personal thing is, um, is working to um, address the historic harms and traumas of our history in a way that seeks reconciliation and change, then that, you know, there are very specific areas to get involved um, that hopefully will inspire people from wherever they sit. Um, to close, I just want to give, I, I'm looking through the questions again, and there's a lot of questions that would be wonderful things for us to discuss if we had all the time in the world, and sadly we don't. Maybe we can um, respond to them um, through the Q&A, um, through the Q&A function. But um, I would love to just offer it back to Dr. Waller for some closing comments. And, um, and I know we're running short on time, so brief comments would be great. Oh yeah, that's trust me, they'll be brief and I probably am the probably be better to hear from any of the rest of you other than me. But I do want to circle back to Glenn's poor Glenn's question. Said, I'm so depressed. Give me some hope, please. Uh, Glenn, I that was never uh, certainly the uh, the mission for today, certainly my mission. I'm sure it wasn't Amanda's mission as she pulled the panel together either. I do think, as I said. We can't begin to solve a problem once we recognize we have one. I think the recognition we have it is the first step in that journey. The great news is that here we are, Portland, noon on a Tuesday afternoon, and 75 people showed up to have this discussion about what our country is like, what situation we're in, how can we how we can make the situation better? You have people like Jess and Mike and Amanda and the program at Portland State who are committing to committed to making those differences. We've got a lot of hard work to do. It's a lot of shared hard work, but it absolutely can be done. I mean, we've done remarkable things as a country and as communities, and we can continue to do that work. And I think it's a matter of, as Amanda said, of each one of us leaving today and saying, what is the thing I can do today to make a difference? And if we can have that attitude toward every day of curiosity and engagement to say, what can I do today to make a difference? We can absolutely make a difference. Nothing here is inevitable. Every country, every story has a room for a better ending. And there's a much better ending here that we can shoot for. And I know we can shoot for that together. So thank you, Glenn, for the question. I hope that gives you some hope. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Jess and Mike as well. Yes, thank you all for, um, thank you for everyone who attended. I mean, having 80 people here on a Tuesday afternoon is a fantastic testament to the importance and resonance of this topic. 
And um, this presentation will be recorded and available at all of the partners' websites and YouTube channels. So please feel free to distribute it and to continue the conversation. There are more events happening throughout the month. You can find a listing of the events on all of our websites, but particularly the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education has all of the registration links um, to find out more information about the events that we have in this series. And I hope to see you all at some of our subsequent conversations. So once again, thank you everyone for coming and thank you presenters and panelists for your contributions. Thanks thank everyone. You. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.